In this example, we'll be doing a finite element analysis of a spherical pressure vessel with a cylindrical nozzle. We'll have three approaches. In the first part, we'll look at a 2D axis metric representation of this vessel. In the second part, we'll be creating a, a quarter symmetric 3D solid model. And in the third part, we'll try to represent this with a 3D shell elements. Uh, again, quarter symmetric representation. We'll assume a steel material property and the yield stress of 300 megapascals. And we are interested in finding out what internal pressure will start yield. That is the what is the elastic limit of this vessel and what is the stress concentration factor especially at the intersection of the cylindrical nozzle and the spherical vessel. Uh, the dimensions are um, straightforward. The sphere has an internal radius of 180 millimeters and outside radius of 200 millimeters and the cylindrical nozzle has uh, 30 millimeters internal and 50 millimeters outer radius. And the length of the nozzle is um, 70 millimeters, but that's uh, relatively arbitrary in this uh, simple example. We will start with the workbench project schematic and drag our static structural analysis system and we'll change the geometry to 2D in order to create our axis metric model. We can then start our design modeler to prepare the um, analysis geometry. Once design modeler starts, we can create our geometry on the XY plane. So we can create our sketch and we can do that by first of all um, creating our automatic constraints and we can draw a couple of arcs and several lines to represent the cross-sectional area so if we zoom in to a distance that is representative of the vessel dimensions we can start by uh, an arc by center so it's constrained at the centroid of the xy plane and then we can start with the um, y-axis and constrain at the opposite end of the y-axis and we can draw another one and we can draw a couple of lines to represent the nozzle and we can dimension them later so we can see that they are constrained vertically we can also draw a line to represent the top and that's going to be constrained horizontally now at that point we can also add um, another line here which is going to be constrained by the two points, the end points of the spherical vessel. So um, we can then go to modify and trim and we can trim the parts that are not required. So these parts are removed. So we'll end up with a uh, closed line segments which represents the cross-sectional uh, area of the pressure vessel. We can now put some dimensions. We can put a radius for the internal and outside surfaces. We can also put some horizontal dimensions and another one for the outside of the cylindrical nozzle and we can put another one a vertical um, based on these two points 
uh, to represent uh, the height of the nozzle. So these are um, enough to constrain the geometry of the uh, vessel. So we can enter some representative dimensions um, that we have created. So 180 millimeters. So that's 0.18 for the inside radius and 0 0.2 meters and the H3 and H4 dimensions are 0 0.03 and 0 0.05. The V5 dimension is 70 millimeters, so it's 0 0.07. So that defines the sketch, and we can go to modeling and then create a surface concept based on the sketch. And we don't need to specify a thickness because that's essentially going to be a, an axisymmetric model. So by generating this, this gives us the cross-sectional area. And we can now finish with this surface body and go to mechanical uh, to apply our boundary conditions and loads. Once mechanical has started, it has transferred our geometry from design modeler and we can see our surface body here. It doesn't have a mesh yet. We can add a couple of sizing controls, for example, and we'll apply it onto our surface and specify an element size of, let's say, 0 0.004. That's four millimeters. That's going to give us a, a fairly coarse mesh and we can update this and later we can try refining it. So mesh is working and it's created a relatively coarse mesh and we'll probably need to refine it around the intersection. So the next operation is to add our boundary conditions and we can add our supports and our pressures. So the support is going to be um, in the x direction. We don't need to constrain anything because it's, an, it's going to be an axisymmetric model. And to specify it's an axisymmetric model, we need to go to the geometry and define the 2D behavior as axisymmetric. And we can go back to mesh. And if you wanted to see the mesh as if it was 3D, we need to do some uh, mesh expansion. And to enable that, there is a, a better option under Workbench. So if you go to Tools, Options, and Appearance, make sure you have the better options checked. And another useful thing is if you have a multiprocessor machine, you can turn on the required number of processors under mechanical APDL. And there are some other settings here which you can explore. But leaving them to defaults for small size models should be okay. So going back to mechanical, we can visualize this as a 3D representation if we add a symmetry so if we go to model A4 and insert in symmetry, and then we can say this is a 2D axis metric representation. And we can try to show it as a quarter symmetric 3D representation. So let's say number of repetitions are 10 and delta theta is 10 degrees. So we can do a view of the mesh and now it looks as if it's a, a 3D model, but we know that it is actually a 2D representation based on the cross section here. We can now add our boundary conditions. So the load itself is going to be mainly the pressure load and we'll need to apply it onto 
internal surfaces. So we need to select the two lines. And the pressure we are going to apply is 1 megapascals. So 1e6. There's going to be another pressure value applied, and that's going to be at the top of the nozzle. That's to represent the nozzle load that is stretching the nozzle in the y direction. In order to calculate the pressure there, we'll need to use a simple spreadsheet, um, but we can also do this parametrically within uh, mechanical. We can visualize the nozzle, and if we think that this nozzle is, uh, has got a closed end, and that's represented by the red circle here. All the uh, pressure applied onto this red circle from within the vessel is going to push the nozzle upwards. So that force can be distributed onto the blue surface here. So to calculate the required force, we can first of all calculate the areas for the red and the blue circles. And the pressure one is the internal pressure on the spherical vessel and also applied onto the red circle. So the area of the red circle times the first pressure, P1, will give us a force value. So that force distributed onto this blue circle is simply divided by the area of the blue circle will give us the pressure and it's going to be a negative pressure to show that it is acting uh, vertically. So that's the value we want to apply. So we can copy that value and going back to mechanical, we can add our second pressure load and that's applied onto the top of the nozzle and the magnitude is what we have calculated in Excel, so we can paste it in here. We also need to constrain the vessel in the y direction, so we can fix a single point. If everything is going to be balanced, if you have calculated the force correctly, the reaction force on this should be nearly zero. It is just to avoid uh, the rigid body motion in the y direction. So we can add a support there, displacement, and we want to constrain it in the y direction. And that's enough to solve the vessel. Um, we can add some deformations, equivalent stresses, and maximum principle, middle principle, and minimum principle. And that's enough to solve this problem. Once the solution is completed, we can look at our solution items. So total deformation is very, very small, um, in the order of a fraction of a millimeter. Our equivalent stress is what we'll need to calculate the maximum pressure required for the limit load of this vessel. That is the elastic limit. So the maximum equivalent stress is calculated as 10.526 megapascals. We can also look at other principal stress quantities. Going back to the equivalent stress, We'll need to increase our pressure to reach 300 megapascals. And because this is a linear elastic model, we can do this simply using an Excel spreadsheet and linear uh, scaling up. So for one megapascals of internally applied pressure, our equivalent stress was 10.5 megapascals. So we're interested in finding out what pressure is required 
to get a yield stress of 300 megapascals. So that's simply a scaling of SEQV2 to SEQV1, and that is multiplied by the initial pressure. So that gives us 2.85 E7 uh, pascals. So we can apply that into our mechanical model. So we can go back and change the pressure. And we can also change pressure too. And that will be also linearly scaled up. So going back to our spreadsheet again, we can change the first pressure. So we can take our P2 value and then paste into uh, P1. And that gives us a pressure value that's going to be applied on the blue circle of about 16 megapascals. So we can copy it into mechanical. And that's again ready to be sold. So we should see something nearly 300 megapascals when we solve for the Eklund stress. So the value we got now is 299.97 megapascals, which is very, very close to the yield stress. So we can say that the pressure to be applied on the inside surface of this vessel, which is 28.5 megapascals, was essentially the elastic limit. We can go back to Eklund stress and to calculate the stress concentration factor, we need to find out what is the maximum stress, which was say 299.97, nearly 300, and then scale it with a stress that's on the inside surface of the vessel, for example, as a normalizing value. So we can do a probe and then on the inside surface, um, we get a value of about 157 megapascals. So 157 compared to 300. So the intersection uh, stress concentration factor is around 300 divided by 157. So that gives a stress concentration of about 1.91.